According to the teaching of St. Gregory of Sinai, when the passions are active, some thoughts proceed and some follow. In other words, sometimes the thought comes first and the fantasy follows, and sometimes the fantasy comes first and the thought follows, though this happens more rarely. In any case, thoughts are very closely connected with fantasies and imaginings. Every thought is an imagination in the news of something perceptible to the senses. Every thought is a combination of an image and a concept. It is not a simple idea, but is always linked with fantasy and imagination. Man's noose, revolving around and preoccupied with images originating from the senses, formulates various kinds of thoughts by reasoning, analogy, and inference. This happens in various ways, passionately or dispassionately or somewhere in between, with or without error. These thoughts give rise to most virtues and vices and to opinions, whether right or wrong. St. Gregory Palamas The prevailing state of our thoughts is of paramount importance. If our thoughts are satanic, they poison our whole spiritual organism. If they are divine, they create spiritual health within us. Thoughts are always linked with imaginings, good or bad. As sense perceptions and thoughts are closely connected with passions, fantasies and imaginings also originate from the passions or are even expressed through them. St. Nalos the ascetic identifies an important point. If someone gets rid of his passions but continues to be negligent, he will find that the images of past fantasies begin to emerge again like young shoots. We can eradicate the passions and struggle to make them inactive, but the images of past fantasies can penetrate our imaginative faculty if we are careless and do not live with spiritual vigilance. Anyone who is not vigilant and watchful creates the conditions for the passions to come back in through their images. Thus the passions produce fantasies and imaginings, and fantasies and imaginings create an environment in which these passions can reappear. Since the greatest and most terrible passion of all is pride, fantasy and imagination are closely linked with pride. Someone who is proud has something wrong with his imaginative faculty. It is inflamed. It conceives all kinds of images and fantasies and makes his soul an earthquake zone. Fantasies and imaginings are also expressed in dreams, which are the main indication that images exist within the soul. St. Diodokos of Fatiki says, Dreams are generally nothing more than images reflecting our wandering thoughts, or else they are the demon's mockery. Most dreams are the result of imagination originating from the development and existence of passions. Consequently, those who are engaged in the acquisition of virtue must take care never to trust imagination. Also, St. Maximo says that when desire increases the materials that cause sensual pleasure, then the news fantasizes during sleep. Dreams are fantasies, and they relate to the passions existing within us. From the images in these fantasies, we can discern which passions we have. Since fantasies and imaginings are a phenomenon of our fallen state, and both the devil and man have imagination, man is subjected to satanic energy through his imaginative faculty, as we mentioned above. The devil deceives us through fantasy and imagination, and many mental images are the result of his work. St. Hezekios the priest says, Being a bodiless noose, the devil is unable to deceive our souls except through fantasies and thoughts. He continually excites the soul's rational and imaginative faculties, and many sins are a result of the devil's drastic action. The Consequences of Fantasy and Imagination From what has been said so far, it is clear that when the imagination is continually cultivated, it produces many disorders within our spiritual organism. An arousal of fantasy and imagination is concealed in almost every sin and is the main source of trouble. It infects the whole soul and continuously corrupts it. Two serious and terrible consequences of fantasy can be identified as follows. The first 
is that it distorts a person's whole spiritual life and leads him to self-theosis. Archimandrite Sophrony writes, Such demonic images and those conjured up by man may influence people, altering or transforming them, but one thing is inevitable. Every image, whether created by man himself or suggested by demons and accepted by the soul, will distort the spiritual image of man created in the image and after the likeness of God. This creation, in its ultimate development, leads to the self-divinization of the creature, that is, to the affirmation of the divine principle as contained in the very nature of man. Because of this, natural religion, religion of the human mind, may fatefully assume a pantheistic character. Insofar as thoughts play an important role in man's spiritual state, thoughts connected with fantasy, particularly demonic fantasy, inevitably distort his whole spiritual life. A person can reach the point of recognizing elements of divinity within himself, and once he recognizes elements of the divine in something created, he is actually a pantheist. Any ideas we have, if we worship them, impart this pantheistic character. Self-theosis is the greatest sin of all. It is the sin into which Adam fell, which led to the distortion of man's whole life, inward and outward, with devastating consequences. Self-deification, the recognition of a divine principle within ourselves, is actually a repetition of Adam's fall. Contemporary natural religions, along with meditation, yoga, and so on, come into this category. The second consequence, related to the first, is that fantasy and imagination give rise to many psychological abnormalities, even hallucinations and delusions. When someone assiduously cultivates daydreams, even daydreams about spiritual states, and particularly when he continues doing this for many years, his whole spiritual life is distorted, and he suffers from serious psychological and pathological disorders. People can reach this point through practicing meditation. Again, Archimandrite Sophrony remarks, they conjure up scenes from the life of Christ or similar sacred studies. It is generally neophytes who adopt this course. With this sort of imaginative prayer, the mind, noose, is not contained in the heart for the sake of inner vigilance. The attention stays fixed on the visual aspect of the images considered as divine. This leads to psychological, emotional excitement, which, carried to an extreme, may result in a state of pathological ecstasy. One rejoices in what one has attained, clings to the state, cultivates it, considers it to be spiritual, charismatic, the fruits of grace, and so sublime that one thinks oneself a saint and worthy of contemplating divine mysteries. But in fact, such states end in hallucinations, and if one does not succumb to mental illness, at the least one continues bewitched and living in a world of fantasy. This is how demonic states of delusion and heresy come about. As is obvious from what we have mentioned, the soul of the person in this state is sick. Every deluded person and heretic who cultivates his imagination is sick in his soul. This is what deadens the soul. St. Gregory of Sinai says that when the noose fantasizes, it loses even the slight God-given condition it had and becomes altogether dead. Someone preoccupied with his imagination is in grave danger of being deprived of what little grace he has and often of losing his mind. Deceived by fantasy, he often becomes insane, and then even an alleged hesychast becomes a fantasist and not a hesychast. The monastic tradition knows of many such cases of ascetics who were deluded precisely because they were careless about the serious matter of fantasy and imagination. They lost their salvation, but also their minds. We see many such cases in secular society, too. We come across people who intensely cultivate their imaginative faculty and are inwardly disturbed. Nervous disorders and insanity are a clear indication that the imaginative faculty is overdeveloped and inflamed. 
Upper Poimen says that he knew a monk whom the devil attacked so fiercely through his imagination that on one occasion he thought he saw a brother sinning with a woman. When he could not bear to look any longer, he drew near to touch them with his hand and say, Now stop! How much longer? Then it turned out to be sheaves of corn. There was nobody there, but the sheaves of corn looked like people, or the devil gave them that appearance. Also, Abba Ilias narrates that he once saw someone taking a flask of wine under his arm. He saw someone stealing wine. However, he realized that Satan was at work, and immediately asked the brother to show him what he had under his cloak. There was actually nothing there at all, and he recognized that it was the action of demons. Of course, these two examples do not imply that those monks saw such things because they had lost their wits by stimulating their imagination. It was the work of the devil. We mention these examples, however, to make clear that it is possible to see non-existent things through satanic activity, but also through stimulating the imagination. We can experience hallucinations and illusions. Just as a drug addict often suffers from delusions under the influence of drugs, so someone in the grip of fantasy and imagination sees things that do not exist and suffers from delusions and hallucinations. The cultivation of imagination and fantasy leads to hallucinations and delusions when assisted by the action of a sick human brain. On imagination, fantasy and prayer. Prayer, especially what is called pure prayer of the heart, should be free from fantasy and imagination. A noose caught up in fantasy is incapable of praying purely. The prayer of such a noose is impure, full of mental images and fantasies. The imagination is hostile to pure prayer and the diligent work of the noose. As Callistos and Ignatius Xanthopoulos say, this accursed fantasy is a great obstacle to pure prayer of the heart and to the single undistracted work of the noose. The saintly fathers teach that all those who want to pray purely must pray with God's help, without fantasies, imaginings, impressions, with the noose and soul holy and completely pure. They should not form mental images concerning God. The noose must remain pure and immaterial. Only then can pure prayer unfold in the heart. St. Nalos, the ascetic, advises, Stand on your guard and protect your noose from conceptual images while you are praying. Again, he urges, never try to see a form or shape during prayer. Elsewhere, he teaches us not to form an image of God inside us when we pray. When you are praying, do not form any image of the deity within yourself, and do not let your noose be stamped with the impression of any form, but approach the immaterial in an immaterial manner and you will understand. We also need to be cautious about the delight we feel during prayer. Fantasy may develop, especially among those who live together and pray as a community. St. John Climacus says that the joy felt by those who live in a monastic community is different from that experienced by those who pray in Hesychia. The former may be slightly influenced by imagination, whereas the latter is full of humility. Consequently, the most suitable prayer is, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me, a sinner, which should be said without using the imagination and accompanied by sincere and profound repentance. When someone prays purely, he is illuminated and enlightened by God. This illumination is divine grace, which comes to man through pure prayer. St. Diodocus of Photiki says, The blessed light of the divinity only rises when the heart is completely empty of everything and free from all form. When man's noose is free from impressions, when it does not accept any fantasies or imaginings, it receives the rays of divine brilliance, according to Callistos and Ignatius Xanthopoulos. During prayer, the noose must also be clear of every conceptual image. The concept of God is not one of those thoughts that imprint images in the noose, but one that makes no imprints. This is why the person praying 
must separate himself completely from concepts that imprint images in the noose. We must reject all conceptual images during prayer. The pure noose is called the throne of God, according to the same fathers. Certainly the Holy Fathers recommend great caution, because someone can pray calmly and purely, and yet be approached by a strange and alien figure, originating from the devil, which compels him to accept it as divine, with the result that he falls into presumption and pride. This is a trap set by the devil. St. Nalos the ascetic writes, Be on your guard against the tricks of your adversaries. While you are praying purely and calmly, sometimes some strange and alien form suddenly comes before you, making you imagine in your conceit that the deity is there. Their purpose is to persuade you that the figure suddenly disclosed to you is divine. Of course, God is without quantity or form. There are many criteria for distinguishing theoria that comes from God, from that which comes from the devil. However, the Holy Fathers recommend us not to accept any concept or vision while praying. If it is from God, God knows how to convince us. St. John Climacus recommends, do not accept any sensory image during prayer, lest you be distracted. We refuse every perceptible image and every kind of imagination and fantasy during prayer. As the Holy Fathers say, the uncreated light is shapeless, tranquil, single, and colorless. The opposite is true of diabolical light, on imagination, fantasy, and theology. We have already mentioned that pure theology develops in the person who has been freed from fantasies and imaginings. Anyone who has passed through the stages of purification, freedom from sensual pleasure and pain, and illumination of the noose, freedom from forgetfulness and ignorance, and has been delivered from fantasy's images, has acquired pure theology. He is initiated into pure knowledge of God. The eyes of his noose are able to receive divine energy, as St. Maximus says, because knowledge of God is linked with the theoria of uncreated light, St. Hesychios, the priest, stresses that the blessed light of divinity rises within us when our noose is freed from everything and is without form. Then the noose is in its natural state and is ready to proceed to all kinds of delightful spiritual theoria pleasing to God. A theologian is someone in whom the deifying energy of the triune God dwells. However, just as God does not dwell in man-made temples, neither does he dwell in any imaginings or fabrications of the noose, as St. Basil the Great says in his teaching. When man's noose is driven by the soul's imaginative faculty and the senses, it engenders a composite form of knowledge. This is the teaching of St. Gregory Palamas. When the noose enthrones itself on the soul's imaginative faculty and thereby becomes associated with the senses, it engenders a composite form of knowledge. The Holy Fathers talk about two kinds of theoria. There is one kind of action and grace that is received, and another that is apprehended. They teach that these two types of theoria are as far apart as the east is from the west and the heaven from the earth and that one is as superior to the other as the soul is superior to the body. The theoria that is received is more excellent. It is engendered in the heart by God himself hypostatically, and also transmits this energy and grace outwards to the body. Theoria that is apprehended is lower. It is produced externally, and by considering how well created things are directed, ordered, and arranged. By bringing together different images into a semblance of the truth, it progressively reaches up to God in faith. Received theoria is engendered in the heart by God hypostatically, whereas apprehended theoria comes from looking at God's creation and His ruling providence. The second type of theoria involves an element of imagination. The first type, the superior received theoria is the unadulterated theoria of God, which is sometimes called apophatic theology. 
Besides, as St. Isaac the Syrian says, our soul has two eyes. With one eye we see what is hidden in nature, apprehended Theoria, and with the other we behold the glory of God when God leads us to the spiritual mysteries, received Theoria. The prophets did not speak about God using their imagination, but through God's revelation in their heart and noose. St. Basil the Great says that the prophets saw images imprinted in their governing faculty, noose, by the Spirit. As St. Gregory Palamas teaches, the Holy Spirit settles upon the noose of the prophets and, using this governing faculty as material, announces the future to them and through them to us. God revealed His mysteries to the prophets within their heart, to their noose. Their reason, aided by appropriate education, which includes images of the world perceptible to the senses, articulates this revelation, but the revelation itself has absolutely nothing to do with the imaginative faculty. The Holy Fathers speak about God without using their imagination. Also, what is termed a symbol in theology is not simply a symbol or something symbolic, but an energy that comes from the very nature of the divine being. The prophets and those initiated into holy mysteries do not imagine God, but God is revealed to their pure hearts. On liberation from fantasy and imagination, all this shows that we must be freed from what the Holy Fathers call a cursed fantasy, which is the source of many bodily and spiritual disorders. We shall identify ways of freeing ourselves from this horrific, disfiguring condition. In the first place, we have to fight against fantasy and imagination. We must realize that we need to struggle to get rid of them. As St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite says, Impassioned fantasy has more power and domination over us than the senses themselves. In order for the senses to sin, they need various things or pretexts, whereas the imagination works without anything, even when the senses are not functioning. In addition, we must not accept any images at all from the imaginative faculty. When we realize that our imaginative faculty is at work, we should immediately stop it. St. Diodocus says, We can achieve great virtue just by never trusting our imagination. The Holy Fathers advise us not only to reject thoughts, but not even to believe what we see with our eyes or hear with our ears. Even if you see something with your own eyes or hear it, do not accept it, according to Abba Ilias. Indeed, Abba Poimen commands, Even if you touch something with your own hands, do not testify to it. We must make an effort to reject what thoughts and fantasies tell us, but also to refuse to process information gathered by our senses, because the devil may tempt us through the senses. We must keep calm even when faced with imaginary images coming from the devil. When the devil troubles us during prayer, we should not be disturbed. St. Nalos the ascetic says that, even if you see a sword drawn against you, or a torch before your eyes, or a disgusting and bloody figure, do not be shaken, stay calm, and do not lose heart at all. There is absolutely no need to be anxious. A good confession of faith is needed. Pray to Christ with faith, and they will disappear. There are circumstances, mainly at the beginning of our spiritual struggle, where, if we cannot completely reject imagination, we should at least put it to good use. This undoubtedly involves the risk that we may remain in this condition and suffer other psychosomatic problems. Saints Callistos and Ignatius Xanthopoulos teach that imagination should be discarded altogether. If we cannot achieve this by repentance, humility, and contrition, then we should contradict and counterbalance it with well-ordered imagination. This is said with many reservations and only applies when we are at the beginning of the spiritual struggle, the aim being that we should quickly abandon this method. As fantasy and imagination are closely connected with the soul's illness and existing passions, they are healed by our endeavor to cure our soul 
and free ourselves from passions. As St. Maximus says, once the soul starts to be aware of its own good health, then even its imaginings during sleep become simple and calm. We must also strive to keep our noose pure. This is called vigilance or watchfulness, nepsis, in the language of the New Testament and the Holy Fathers. Saints Callistos and Ignatius Xanthopoulos write that the noose is an essence that is indivisible, simple, and complete within itself. We must keep it pure and radiant, and ensure it is separate from the imagination with no participation in it. Guarding the noose is a very good method of getting rid of the burden of imagination and fantasy. The only way to achieve spiritual vigilance is by examining the imagination closely, because the devil cannot provoke and deceive the noose in the absence of thoughts linked with fantasy and imagination, according to St. Asychios the priest.